My name is uh, Jan Jul Jensen. I'm from Informi GIS uh, in Co uh, our office in Copenhagen. And uh, Informi GIS is uh, the, uh, the uh, official ESRI distributor in Denmark. So uh, when I speak about ESRI and PSI today, it's uh, more like uh, with a Danish per perspective or from a Danish perspective. <clears throat> Uh, a little bit about my background. I, I've been in this company, this private company, for for 13 years now. But uh, before that, I was working for the Ministry of the en Environment. I did a lot of uh, data standardization and uh, uh, did research and did uh, GIS uh, um, strategy work and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's kind of mixed ba background. Now, now I'm a solution strategist. Uh, in our business development unit, um, I've been part of the Inspire network in, in, that was hosted by the, uh, uh, the Danish uh, Geodata Agency, and, and uh, I've been uh, uh, our representative at at, uh, at the OGC uh, at the time we were associated member. So that's just a little bit about uh, about me. Um, my, my uh, short agenda for today is uh, just very short about Informi GIS and, and about ESRI. In case you don't know Informi, probably only a few of you know about my company. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then afterwards, I'm going to talk a little bit about GIS patterns uh, before uh, talking about content and about the uh, PSI, the role that PSI uh, is uh, is playing in in, in that uh, community content, and I think uh, you will find that uh, uh, in in many ways I'm aligned with what uh, Ed and, and and Steph talked about, and uh, even though there's some uh, some uh, overlap between uh, what you can do with OpenStreetMap and what you can do in, in the, on the ESRI platform. There, there's also a, a lot of uh, similarities to, to some of the challenges that, that you were addressing, uh, Simon. And then uh, finally, I will talk a little bit about the uh, platforms for, for de delivering uh, open data. So that's the agenda. Um, about uh, Informi GS, it's it's a private Danish company. It's not uh, we, we've been in business for more than 20 years and, and are completely focused on on uh, geographic information and and uh, making solution uh, on uh, on geodata and geographic information. Uh, we are SME, only about 70. Uh, employees and and we are partner with uh, with the Danish Geodata Agency. So uh, when Ulla earlier today spoke about uh, those relationships, we are part of that. <coughs> we have about uh, 250 something public and private customers, just to give you an idea. And, and that's pretty good in in a small country like uh, like Denmark. And as I said, we are the offic official ESRI distributor. About ESRI, uh, that's uh, a little bit larger than our company. It's uh, founded back in 1969 in California. It is the provider of the RGS platform. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about that, uh, but uh, I won't get into too much detail. Uh, ESRI has about uh, uh, 350,000 clients uh, around the world, um, 3,000 employees, and then uh, 80 uh, distributors worldwide uh, and, and we are one of them. <coughs> so of course we have a close relationship uh, with ESRI. Uh, we are uh, providing the, uh, the RGS platform here in Denmark, doing solutions that we sell in Denmark but also work worldwide. Um, um, yeah. If you, if you look how GIS has evolved over uh, the years, and especially in, 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 the, in the latest years, uh, there's a really big change, and, and, and that really has a great impact on the way that you need to provide data as part of, uh, of, 
of the solution. Um, Ed was showing this uh, uh, this uh, screenshot of a, of a I could recognize it as an Arc GIS desktop uh, screenshot. And uh, even though there's still a lot of uh, uh, GIS uh, geeks who likes to have a lot of uh, tools in in in, in the, the application, most people don't want that uh, anymore. I agree. But what really changed the uh, the game, I would say, is that more and more uh, use of geodata is is uh, is web based use and it's uh, and it's moving into the cloud infrastructure and the impact of that technological development is uh, that from uh, uh, from having a customer base that were storing data on their own premises. We are now moving into new uh, um, <coughs> industries and new sectors that have a completely different approach to using uh, uh, geographic information. And uh, when, when, you, when you have that shift from, from having, uh, let's say, more traditional GIS users to, to have users in businesses that just considered geographic information as a part of all the information they are consuming. They, they just simply don't want to run too much infrastructure themselves. So they like to use web services and uh, software as a service as a way to get, in, get to that information. Or they like to integrate that type of information into all the other enterprise systems that they are already using. So that's a huge shift in the way that people are using geographic information. If you look at the, uh, the RGS uh, uh, platform that, uh, that ESRI is providing, it reflects that, uh, that uh, change in, in, in uh, access to, to data. Uh, it used to be uh, desktop and then uh, desktop and a database and then a server and a database but now it's a much more uh, heterogeneous uh, infrastructure or architecture in which you use local data and combine it with all the sources that, that you can get to um, and some of that is, is uh, data in your own company or own organization and of course, a lot of that data is, uh, is uh, public, public sector information. <coughs> and even though I think, <coughs> excuse me, even though I think we use the term portal in different ways, Portal is part of this, uh, this uh, whole platform now and, and, and Portal is just a way to get access to data, not concentrated in one place, but, but, uh, but uh, directing you to all the sources that, uh, that you would like to, uh, to get to. A very important part of, uh, of, uh, of the platform is content. And uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, very diverse uh, set of uh, geographic information that that's uh, available through this platform now. It's uh, it's uh, terrain, it's uh, topographic maps, of course, it's uh, open street map as as one of uh, of the data sets. It's uh, landscape places, and so on and so on, and it's. Uh, it's a data that is uh, uh, generated, collected uh, through the cooperation with a lot of different uh, uh, communities. Israel is uh, cooperating with national mapping of organizations. They are cooperating with private companies and they're using us, local distributors, to get to, to, uh, to the data that's uh, part of open data, part of uh, PSI. <clears throat> and uh, 
bibliotek af, af, af Danish, uh, Danish uh, perspective on, on, uh, on this. You've probably seen this uh, uh, many times uh, if, if, if uh, you have heard Danes talk about it, these uh, basic data and uh, both Adam and, and, and Ulla talked about it this morning. <coughs> When uh, when you read this, uh, which is uh, available from from uh, from uh, the website of the Danish uh, Digitization uh, Agency, uh, I think there's two uh, two points that you should notice, and the first one is that uh, the title of of, of this uh, 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 um, publication is "Good Basic Data for Everyone: A Driver for Growth and Efficiency." And I think, in the shadow of the uh, of the financial crisis, it's a uh, with a, it's very uh, it's it's with a purpose that that the Ministry of Finance has uh, put it in that order: growth and efficiency. Um, and the other part is within the text of this that uh, that. Uh, when they talk about the geographic basic data, they say this means that private businesses will also be free to use geographic basic data in their commercial products and solutions, even in combination with other information. That's uh, if if you joined us this morning, you saw the the picture of the happy guy uh, at the at the Danish Geo Data Agency. Uh, that's uh, the open street guy in in in, in Denmark. Uh, we had a similar set of, uh, of data on, on some hard disk uh, and, uh, and we were going like this too because that was really a, uh, a happy day. <clears throat> and how, how did we uh, how do you, did we use that data? First of all, uh, we started to work on that data and, and uh, this is uh, uh, in the same way that, that uh, Google has used these open data and OpenStreetMap has used these data. Uh, ESRI has this uh, uh, topographic base map and we have uh, refined the, the content in, in that base map uh, based on on one of Ulla's slides, she was mentioning fold data, which is all the basic features I would say for a topographic map. So uh, we had to do the same work that, that is challenging and that is to, to transform the data from the geodata agency into the data model that fits, uh, fits uh, uh, the topographic base map. But, but you really get a lot of uh, details, extra details, by using these uh, uh, open data. Like uh, different, uh, it's like uh, uh, buildings, it's uh, nature er areas, uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, different uh, point of interest, uh, amusement parks, and so on and so on. But there's a lot of work to do to 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 fit it into this uh, topographic map. So that was the first part, and it has been done in a similar way in, in, in other countries, uh, like in the Netherlands, uh, uh, they open up for, the, for, for their topographic data from the, from the uh, Dutch cadastral, uh, uh, I think it's a couple of years now, uh, and they, they, they have used the same basic data model, and, and one of the benefits is that you will get the same topographic map uh, uh, globally. And that's uh, in the same direction that, that it was talking about the necessity or, 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 or the pleasure to, to, to have the same uh, visual expression um, uh, no matter whether you are in, 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 in Aalborg or in, in Amsterdam or in uh, somewhere in Asia. So that's, a, that's really a, a benefit. And, and it's not only about the uh, having a nice uh, coherent map is also about when you start to use that type of background uh, uh, base map in combination with other data for example for, for cross-border emergency management operations that's really uh, 
that's really needed to have the, the same uh, uh, base map to 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 uh, get get this uh, common operational picture. We we took an extra step based on the uh, on the open uh, geographic data uh, that we got from from uh, from uh, from the the geodata agency. Uh, we we have uh, customers in, 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 in almost all industries and we were listening to which data sets are the most important for you to get uh, access to. And then we took that data and published it on, the, on the, what is called RGS.com, RGS Online. And uh, we published it both as, uh, as uh, map services and feature services so our customers will get access to all the, the uh, data behind uh, all the attribute data that's related to to uh, to the features and uh, just to give you an example of uh, a few examples it's about uh, uh, high resolution imagery imagery it's about the uh, uh, administrative geographic uh, boundaries and it's about the uh, address points and building footprints and parcels. That's uh, some of the most uh, wanted data sets for, for, for our customers. And if we then... Yeah. Okay. This, this is just showing that uh, that all the attribute information uh, is is uh, is part of those services, and that's that's really important to to be able to to combine that data with with all the other uh, data sources. So the benefits is well, I wrote Danish basic data online, but uh, but it could be any PSI. Uh, uh, data I think it's a uh, it's really important to increase the visibility that's a that's a really big challenge in, in government there's there's a there's so much data and it's so hard to get a good understanding of what that data is and having uh, having a uh, uh, this search catalog with with the with the maps uh, uh, thumbnails really change and, and, and you get a lot of, uh, of uh, metadata uh, related to that information and if needed we could link to some more specific uh, ISO standard uh, metadata like uh, the Inspire profile if, if, uh, if needed. Um, we also wanted to improve the accessibility to, to those data to make it uh, easy for, for, for the end users to get that data and use it in a variety of different uh, standard applications, including those software as a service uh, applications that, that's, uh, that's available now. And uh, by having uh, those specific data set, we have a good, uh, good foundation for doing mashup with other PSI sources or it could be the company's own uh, information. And then there's uh, many of the third part is, is, is uh, supporting uh, partly uh, the more traditional use of, of uh, geographic information, but there's a whole new area, I would say almost exploding uh, right now, and that's uh, location analytics. And from my point of view, Location analytics is about bringing geographic data into other enterprise systems instead of bringing enterprise system data into GIS. And that's uh, uh, like the, the office uh, uh, suite. We have an example where we combine the Excel spreadsheet and uh, some of the authoritative uh, Danish uh, data and you can use it for geocoding your your uh, your maybe customer uh, data or or 
statistical data, whatever you can think of. And this is really sometimes when you have been in, in, in the GIS and geodata uh, um, profession for many years, you think that, uh, that uh, people need a lot of, of uh, advanced uh, uh, tools to, to do all sorts of uh, data analysis and, and manipulation and so on. But when you, when you get out to, to uh, industries that's not used to handle geographic information, very, very simple uh, visualization and, and, uh, and uh, the capability of matching up data, that, that makes a huge difference. And that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's completely in line with what Ed was talking about, giving these very, very simple user interfaces, uh, focused applications, instead of having a huge complex uh, application with a lot of... Uh, it's like, you know, I don't know how many of you have a microwave oven, and it, it has so many different functions and, and, and most people just heat the, their food or, 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 uh, or uh, what, what is called uh, uh, warm up the, the popcorn or something like that. And it's, you know, it's completely the same, same thing with, 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 uh, with uh, if you really want to get ge geographic information and, and public sector information out. Uh, 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 Adam was talking about this uh, uh, open data strategy, no, innovation strategy, which in Danish is more about uh, about bringing data into play, um, and and that's exactly what what that is about. And then finally, there's a huge uh, uh, huge uh, opportunity for for getting those data into play by providing open APIs and, and, and easy to use services for, for the whole developer uh, society. And we are working uh, uh, closely uh, together with, with, with developer so societies in, in Denmark and, and we are supporting startup companies uh, uh, because we can use our, all our knowledge about geographic information and combine it with their, their uh, uh, knowledge, their skills in, in, in programming to make some amazing uh, applications, uh, really valuable applications. So who's go going to benefit from, 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 uh, from uh, let's say, these exercises that, that we have done? Uh, there's no doubt that there's a, a lot of efficiency to gain in, in, the, in the public sector, but, uh, but if you really want to have growth, you need to address those private, uh, private industries. And we, we are seeing a lot of activities and a lot of interest in, in, in retail, banking, insurance, uh, consultancy, analytic uh, companies, and it's, uh, it's uh, certainly partly to be attributed to, to Google because just a, just a few years ago, uh, people in those areas didn't have any idea about how to use a map. And now it's, uh, now it's, uh, now it's a demand from, from those uh, industries to visualize and analyze data and, and, and patterns in their own company data in combination with those uh, public sector information. And, uh, and uh, some, some of the, the data, which is not available right now, but that we hope to see in, 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 in a short term, that's, uh, that's all the statistical data, because that really will make a change in, in most of these uh, industries. If you are if you are building uh, applications, uh, and, and I think this is a, this is a, a part of the, the the trend within the industry. If you, if you are building applications or doing coding, 
you can share it on, on uh, GitHub or other, uh, like Steph was talking about. But if you want to make a commercial uh, application as part of that, there's more and more uh, companies like Esri who's now uh, uh, providing uh, marketplaces that you can use as a as a window into into those applications. So that's uh, that's uh, certainly a new way to get the, the PSI into the hands of of of, uh, of new industries. And that's it's it's, it's just. Purely, a, a, you know, it's it's like uh, watching the window down at at, at the at the uh, uh, supermarket or, or bakery or something. Like it, that's that's all what it is, and it's um, it's not uh, it's not like you have to pay to to put your applications on this marketplace. It's just linking to to your uh, uh, your your own let's say business model for for your application. If you're not, uh, if you are in the public sector, there's uh, there's there's also uh, ways to 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 share uh, uh, share uh, geographic information, and and uh, uh, the 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 elf uh, Atina was talking about elf, and and, and uh, Esri is also uh, participating in, in in this work. I'm not. A, I'm not an expert in this. I know that there's a there's some uh, guys from from uh, Israel Redlands with, that will uh, be here for for the whole week, and if you like to talk with them about it, they, uh, uh, go see them. They they will have a presentation tomorrow at uh, 11 in uh, auditorium number two, and so uh, that's that's a, a possibility. But it's I think it's really. Um, uh, interesting and fascinating how how uh, industry how private companies and 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 the public sector comes together to 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 uh, to work on ways to to get access to to all those wonderful data that uh, that uh, that the public sector is is uh, generating and finally uh, I like to mention a new initiative from from uh, from Esri, which is uh, what they call the ArcGIS Open Data, and that's uh, that's uh, let's say a new functionality in in the in their uh, in the ArcGIS Online uh, uh, portal that uh, makes you able to uh, to uh, share data and uh, give access for download of, of, of data so so that's that's uh, like a new or extra you could say uh, uh, opp opportunity or option for 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 sharing uh, uh, for sharing data that's all i had to say today uh, I know that the that these uh, oh yeah that's uh, just another screenshot um, that's all I have to say you're welcome to contact me I won't be here for the conference but there will be uh, a number of uh, of, uh, of guys from from Esri uh, during the whole week so so go see them and uh, and go talk with them thank you. Yeah, so my name is uh, Simon Koppendorf, uh, and I'm going to present some joint work with Torbjörn Nielsen, and we are from the Danish Geodata Agency, and we are going to talk about, I'm going to talk about how we got data in play, uh, or how Geodata evolved into uh, social media. This is our Denmark and Minecraft project. Uh, first of all, a few words about what Minecraft is. It's a very popular 3D sandbox game that's played by millions around the world. Inside Minecraft everything is made out of blocks which are approximately one cubic meter in size. And in, in the game you can break the blocks, you can place blocks and you can build things. There are also some monsters in there, but we didn't focus on, on them. 
<clears throat> when you play the game, you, uh, Minecraft will also generate a terrain for you. And it's a lovely terrain, but it's not very realistic. And uh, looking at our kids playing this, we started to think that it could be a good idea to put uh, real geographic data in there. So that was the idea. What would happen if we were able to put uh, real geographic data into Minecraft, specifically our open and free Danish geodata? Then Minecraft would become a high performance and very intuitive 3D GIS system, but most importantly with a user base larger than any traditional GIS system. Uh, and I should perhaps stress that the user interface is very intuitive. There are not, not uh, a bunch of buttons like you see in a traditional GIS system. So that was our idea. Use Minecraft as a 3D GIS system where you can view and interact with our data. So Torbjörn and I uh, decided to go ahead with the project in our free time at first just to make a proof of concept and as a showcase for what you could do with the free Danish geodata. And also because we saw a lot of interesting applications here, like in education, uh, the case of using Minecraft in education is already established, but if you make a geographically based model, you, you should be able to use it in mathematics, geography, history, art, lots of things but also in urban and rural planning as a tool to democratize the planning process and include some demographic groups that are otherwise hard to reach. Uh, the project soon gained momentum at the Geodata Agency and was formalized as an official project half a year ago or something. So we decided to go ahead and create the model and in our daily work we use a lot of open source tools like <coughs> Quantum GIS, Post, GIS databases, GDAO or Google for handling lots of geospatial data formats, also other tools. So using those, building upon those tools, we were able to write a few thousand lines of code and complete the project in well, with not so much development time, actually. In the end, we had a completely automated production system, starting uh, from a download of data from the official sources. We made a case out of using only the open and free data so that everyone else could have done the same thing as us. We then fiddled a little <laughs> bit about with uh, some of the data and established a huge post GIS database containing all the vector data, some address data and also some cadastral data. Uh, from that, uh, combining those data with the terrain model, uh, putting them into our little program, we could generate Minecraft worlds. And it was a completely automatic process, so uh, it was just a matter of applying enough computers to uh, generate the whole country. Of course, we, we had some steps in the development. The first one up here is the Hello World uh, example. We were able to represent our terrain model in Minecraft and realized that this could be done, so let's go ahead. And th then we put more and more features on the map. All in all, I guess it was done in uh, two or three weeks of working time. Finally, we ended up with uh, uh, this model. This is a snapshot from the final model near the harbor of Aarhus, where you actually, actually can see a lot of the features that are in the model. We have polygons uh, describing land usage. So over here is a park. The trees are not uh, uh, mature yet. They are just planted. We have high-rise buildings here. And uh, down in the bottom, we have uh, something which is 
encoded as industry, so we have used a different texture there. You can also see that we have a little bit of railroad going through here. It's pretty hard to represent in Minecraft uh, where the blocks are pixels are one <coughs> by one meter. But it's possible. We also have lampposts and yeah, uh, bushes, roads, etc. So, here's just another snapshot from uh, Aarhus City, the Art Museum Hours. And actually on our online server, it would be possible to enter the building and start making art. Uh, the primary data source here is probably the terrain model. So in places where we have a lot of height difference, which are not so many places in Denmark, but there are a few places like here, Moon's Glint, the model looks pretty good. Uh, we have height differences for uh, uh, up to something like 100 meters uh, on this Klimt. Um, also, Minecraft only allows you to build up to height 256. So Denmark is a perfect country for uh, to be mapped in Minecraft. Uh, on the 24th of April, we launched the project, and immediately the press coverage was enormous. The Danish television and radio brought the news, partly because I think the people inside the ministry wanted to get the minister in the news also, but it ended up being us instead. Um, and this kind of started a snowballing effect. Uh, BBC and a lot of other medias caught up with the story. And that led to a huge interest for our servers, which couldn't keep up. And we ended a kind of arms race between briefers. I'll say a, a few words on those in, in a minute. And ourselves, which were very new at managing uh, Minecraft servers. That was not our primary job description. So briefers, that's people with uh, destructive in-game behavior, like just generally destroying things, but also trying to take advantages, take advantages of weaknesses in Minecraft and crash the server. So one thing they would do would, uh, they pretty soon found out that we had forgot to disable mine. Uh, T in T in minecarts, so they built systems which could, which could explode that and <coughs> destroy everything. That actually gained a lot of publicity and traveled the internet for weeks. That story, even though it was turned off after a day or something like that. <laughs> Another thing they would do was was to build large machines, which you can do in Minecraft underground and uh, conceal them so that they were hidden for us and that would cause lag on the server. So I was following, following these guys while I was invisible. So they couldn't see me and then I could uh, ban them from the server. So, but after a few days, uh, things were pretty much under control. Still the stories about uh, the total destruction of Denmark and an American invasion continued to travel the internet for weeks. That was quite interesting to observe. But things were pretty much under control and what happened was that people started to move into this model and live in their virtual houses. And a kind of strange virtual society started to form. But first of all, people from all over the world began to build wonderful and weird things. Like here's my son building his grandparents' house in Aarhus. That was not so weird. And <clears throat> Amalien Bo in Copenhagen was one of the places that saw a lot of action. Here is a snapshot from when it was in pretty good shape. Uh, a few players built Kronborg Hamlet's castle to an amazing level of detail. You can enter the building and you have um, lots of details inside and also uh, 
the the prisons underneath underground uh, are included. Uh, it's just a random snapshot somebody built a hotel in a random building in Copenhagen and collaborated on on making this hotel, making rooms and cafeterias and all kinds of stuff. That was pretty fun. Uh, the Cathedral of Roskilde, which is quite old and famous in Denmark, was built by some people. And then, to some of the more weird things, people would build flags and all kinds of weird sculptures. You can see the scale. This is a house down here and trees. So it took a while to build something like that. Also, the central station uh, in Copenhagen saw a lot of action. That was, was a place where people would gather and build flags and whatever. It changed all the time. Um, but in the end, we didn't have the resources to monitor the service uh, 24 hours a day. So we actually turned off editing and chatting and are now thinking about what to do with our service. And we'll move on to some fun facts about the model. Um, it consists of approximately 4,000 billion blocks and is probably the largest Minecraft world in the world. Actually, we were contacted by Guinness Book of Records, so we might uh, get included. Also, it, the download uh, part of the project, which, which was our central, um, which really was well, our main focus, got a lot of attention. Uh, I think this, these numbers are from a couple of weeks inside after, after launch. Uh, at, more, at that point, more than 300,000 uh, uh, zipped Minecraft tiles were downloaded and we have had more than 30,000 unique visitors on our service, which, uh, which was much more than we had expected. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about further perspectives. There's still <coughs> lots of room uh, for improvement of our model. It was something that we did quite rapidly. <coughs> it was quick and dirty, and, and we made a case out of not um, editing data too much, we wanted to, we also had the uh, use case um, to use Minecraft as a quality control thing. So we wanted to see how the data sets um, played together. And we could see that in Minecraft without editing the, the data too much. But you could, of course, do that. Uh, lots of extra layers that you could, could include. And but mo most importantly, I think there are still a lot of relatively unexplored applications like in uh, planning, democratization, if uh, a yeah. municipality is going to build something new, you could uh, make a model available online, uh, serve, start up a server and make people go in and edit, change it to what they think it should look like. And yeah, there are lots of other game engines with similar cap cap capabilities, like uh, there's a Danish game called Builder World, um, which has more realistic physics, and uh, so you can simulate water. Uh, that could make a good point for, for hydrology, um, sea level rise, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So, there was a lot of attention uh, worldwide uh, for this project. Here are some of the user reactions on different fora. And it just seemed like that people from other countries also wanted something like that. Um, so, and there are lots of data out there waiting to be, to be set free. So, something similar could definitely be done for other countries. So, I think the point is that when you, <coughs> when you first see Minecraft, perhaps as a professional GIS user, you think it's too blocky and ugly, but it's so intuitive and you can interact with stuff, and that makes a huge difference. Um, there are lots of game engines that are more polished and 
look fancier, but it does, they don't have the same level of interaction. That's the strong point of, of something like Minecraft. So, that's, that's it. Um, I think if you Google uh, Minecraft and education, you'll find a lot of pages. There's a Finnish company called Minecraft Edu that actually specializes in in that area and and has a lot of use cases and material on their website. We are also trying to on our website gst.dk trying to gather some um, some use cases for education. <coughs> But that's something that's being developed right now by teachers and I hear more and more stories of uh, kids who are actually going to use it in, in, in their schools. So, yeah. Another question about the buildings. The buildings you, you first uh, blew up into the system, did you have the digital model of the buildings or whatever? Uh, well, we, we used the public, publicly, publicly available data for, uh, for the buildings, uh, the, f the free uh, open data that are kind of uniform all over Denmark. And they are not really 3D, they have some 3D-ness to them, but, but the, the detailed roof construction is, is not included. So we could use a DSM, which, which we all also have, but that's too rough. Uh, that was what we found out. So we decided just to make roofs flat. But we have made experiments with uh, real 3D city models and we can also uh, render those. So it's definitely po possible if you have data uh, that are good enough. How did the, uh, the usage of your Minecraft server compare with the sort of professional downloads from, from your, your portal? Uh, it's really hard to say. I think the uh, the last time I heard something, there was no um, synergy effect, so people didn't yet start downloading uh, our other data sets. But maybe at some point they will return and find out that they can use it. But well, 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 Minecraft was just just blew everything out else out of the water. Uh, like we used to have something like uh, 30 new users uh, on our download site per day. Um, then when we launched we got something like 2,000, 3,000 new users per day and then it stabilized on 300 new users per day. So it, it scaled up by a factor of 10. So <laughs> that was, yeah, but we still have to see if, it, if there's a spillover effect to the other data sets. Maybe in 10 years. Yeah. Have you been contacted by other agencies like around Europe or in the world that basically want to replicate your work? Because I guess your data is somewhat standardized, so um, others could replicate that process. Yeah. Um, yes, there are some contacts. It's not, I don't know how formal it is yet, but. It seems like there are other people around, uh, other agencies out there interested in doing a similar thing. But that's something for our bosses to decide if we should help them or, or not. You mentioned you have to write several thousand lines of code before you can Well, the, the formats that, that the game engines use are typically somewhat different from, 
from normal geodata formats. So there has to be some kind of intermediate process. In our case, we used uh, some standard Python libraries, which interacted well with both sites. But um, yes, well, the, a good idea would, would be to make a plugin that could that could simply translate into Minecraft format or build a world format or something. But there's also this Colada format that that some game engines uses for 3D city models. It's a kind of XML format. Well, I don't know that much about it, but I just know that some GIS systems can read it and some game engines can render it. Not Minecraft. But, uh, Yeah, you could do something with with uh, the global digital terrain model, but and it would probably look okay, but it wouldn't be detailed enough. the The point about this that it was to scale at scale one to one, and the data was good enough to give a good representation, so that people th thought they were somewhere they knew. Uh, uh, at their home town, town or something, so it became a virtual world. It was not not just some three D map that you were flying over. So it has to have has have a certain level of detail before it gets interesting. That's true. Uh, how did you convince your bosses that this is a good thing? <laughs> <sighs> well, actually, we developed our proof of concept in our spare time, and then. So we were able to go and present, present it to them, and so it was actually surprisingly how, how uh, fast they adopted the idea. That was a positive experience. They probably have kids in the right age. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you know the answer this and you'll bring this answer, but um, in the negative. Did you reuse any of the work that Ordnance Survey did when they did this last year? No. Uh, they didn't release the code, and uh, the funny thing about it, uh, okay, we, we couldn't find the code, but the funny thing about it was that we, s we started talking about this at some point, and then the news got out that Ordnance Survey had done something similar, and we thought, ah, oh, they uh, came first, but, but it was also an inspiration to say, well, now let's do it, go ahead, let's go ahead. But they did it in a very rough scale, so uh, it was basically just like a, a map that you could see from a high uh, viewpoint, and it would look like a map. Mm, yeah. So just to the point where they leave, where the map become interesting, they start doing web three. Yeah. So, but it was not so much code that we had to write actually. <coughs> Be there that there is kind of a gap between GIS users and uh, the rest of the development business, like game developers. So I I, I don't think that geodata is so hard, but uh, so it's it's kind of surprising. But perhaps geodata is a bit hard to understand, and the formats are. Uh, difficult, and there are so many of them, and that could be a could, also could be the case. Project. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the result is three terabytes for the whole country, mm -hmm. and four thousand billion blocks. That takes a lot of computing power. And it's not something you just do in your average fourteen-year-old laptop. Well, actually, the the point was that we made it so parallel that we could actually do it on and stuff like that, we just had to have 
four or five of them. Then it would take a week. So, but it was, uh, we applied all we knew about databases and all that to, to do that. So, but it was a huge project, of course, and yeah, and a crazy idea, actually. traffic accidents and biking routes for kids, which were the ones that were safe and we were like you know, this whole sitting together. Um, and he kind of like raised his hand sitting in front and he said, yeah, my mom used to know about this. So a week ago, I took all the geodata from like Dijkswaterstaat, who's our like, roads agency, and um, our, uh, the other agency combined it and, and calculated all the black spots so we could tell you know, this, is, this is actually a safe route. And we were like, what? <laughs> The questions? Uh, a more philosophical one. How do we actually harvest now? I mean, Minecraft as a game. How do we harvest the information which people might add into that world? How do we bring it back into our GI system or into other information systems? Well, it is actually possible. You, it, as you can write the format, you can also read it uh, continuously and and you can there are all kinds of plugin that plugins that you can put into Minecraft so you can see all the things that that are built. Um, it is possible to to use it as a tool where you can also put get data uh, the other way out and see changes. It is possible. So it's just a matter of programming a bit. I think that's a really good case for for using Minecraft in urban planning. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that, I, um, yeah. I, I agree. When, when you easily can, can involve a yeah. citizen in it, but I think it's even more important that the younger generation they um, play around easily with that. But is there uh, an idea how to somehow include this or, or reuse what, what they have to do? Uh, well, we don't have any particular uh, projects in that direction, but I know that there are some private companies out there that think, think in that direction. And I know that there have, it has been used for competitions in architecture and stuff like that previously. So um, if you Google it, uh, I'm sure you will find some examples. But we have no... Um, uh, specific projects in that direction. Mm -hmm.